Hello everyone and welcome to Blogging Theology and today I'm delighted to talk again to Abdullah Andalusi. You must welcome sir. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for having me on again. It's great to have you back sir. Excellent. Uh, for those who don't know, Abdullah is an international speaker, thinker and intellectual activist for Islam and Muslim affairs. He's a researcher for the I3 Institute, an instructor and head of the Department of Occidentology at the Quran Initiative and co-founder of the discussion forum, the Muslim Debate Initiative. Now, last night on GB News, Nigel Farage debated Abdullah on whether the UK uh, pro-Palestinian protests are extremist and whether the UK government is right to categorize expressions of support for Palestinians as extremism under their new extremism policy. And that's what we're really going to be talking about today. What is this policy and what's the context and the background of it? So, so Abdullah, um, it was great to see you on television uh, talking to uh, Nigel Farage. How did that go? And, and what's been happening in the UK recently? Why is this such big news? Okay, yes. So I was uh, invited uh, yesterday uh, to speak with Nigel Farage, um, fa famous for his um, pro-Brexit uh, kind of... Mm -hmm. Uh, agenda, um, the UKIP, UK Independence Party, uh, independence from Europe, and he wanted to discuss uh, this this new policy that's been introduced by the British government uh, on the redefinition of extremism. Mm. Um, and I've initially had me on for this, uh, but he uh, it was not actually meant to be about, I suppose, the the Palestine marches per se, per se, uh, the ceasefire marches, what have you. But he, uh, in essence, uh, discussed. Uh, with with others, uh, the need, with, especially with an MP, uh, with a need to to um, uh, to have some kind of uh, policing of these marches. And his mm -hmm. point was that while these marches need to be policed and they might be extremist, uh, is bringing a new redefinition of uh, the extremism term uh, mm -hmm. useful and having a new uh, changing the policy uh, with the uh, government's engagement with civil society or civil society generally. Uh, mm. So that it was it was mainly on that, but because he mentioned the Palestine marches in a ne negative tone, um, led kind of implying, along with with other colleagues, uh, that they are hate marches, uh, they are racist or anti-Semitic or what have you, uh, that I had to step into that and, mm. in essence, uh, really kind of d discuss that first before getting onto the extremism policy. Even though, funnily enough, in the extremism policy, he actually kind of agreed that. Um, uh, the British government, uh, it's not needed for it to redefine uh, uh, extremism as a policy um, to capture people it wants to capture, i.e. mostly you know, pro-Palestine marchers, mm -hmm. um, you know, ceasefire uh, marchers and so on and so forth. Um, uh, one, one reason being that he was, it was uh, not uh, going to be effective. But the main reason, one of the main reasons is that it could even apply to people like him <laughs> because he has been described as having extreme views uh, yeah. by even David Cameron. Um, yeah, really. right. uh, many, many, many years ago. So his views are really described as extreme, uh, and he was ostracized uh, by uh, his own uh, bank. So his bank, uh, uh, you know, uh, cancelled his account. Um, yeah. I believe it's Coots. I believe it was, it was um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because of his stated opinions, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so in a sense, there he's he's sympathetic to uh, not having the government, uh, you know, be able to harass anyone or to deem people persona non grata because he himself. Mm. Was at times deemed persona non grata by mm. many uh, sections of the uh, of the uh, mm. British public. Many of them perhaps right thinking, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So this guy Michael Gove, isn't he? He's a, a British a UK cabinet minister. He's brought out this new definition, hasn't he, of extremism? Which um, I don't have it to hand, but it strikes me as rather woolly and vague and uh, open to interpretation. Um, but Clearly, uh, many people think, or many Muslims say, for sure, it seems to be aimed at Muslims, really, to to delegitimize, uh, deplatform, uh, demonize uh, pro-Palestinian sentiments uh, and other views. If you, you know, if you call for the caliphate, or you know, you don't think Sharia law is terrible or something, then you you know you might be caught in this net. Um, do you, I mean, do you share those concerns that this definition is really aimed at Muslims? Do you think? Oh, I mean, I mean, definitely so. Uh, I mean, even I said Nigel Farage and, and the other um, uh, panelist, uh, Toby Young, mentioned oh, yeah. that in, in essence, this is 
uh, you know, what, what Muslims were in mind uh, regarding this, yeah. as mm -hmm. well as the uh, Palestine demonstrators and ceasefire demonstrators, uh, protesters. Um, they they, uh, they they wanted to capture these people because the law didn't capture them, and the argument that's made is quite insidious. It's it's you know these people uh, they or uh, uh, they they protest or they their act activism is within the law. Uh, so we need to we need to have some way to catch them. So wait wait a second. But isn't that what you want from your citizens? Is their act, act their activities are within the law, right? It's not a problem if people say if people act within the law. Um, you shouldn't say we have to change the law to go and capture them because that, then that means you're now trying to um, uh, persecute and target people that you believe are undesirables or you dis you dislike or disagree with. Um, so it, clearly, there's Muslims in mind. Clearly, there's uh, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, pro ceasefire, um, anti genocide demonstrators in mind uh, to be targeted. Yeah. Um, and this is, in essence, as I said, people say the, the thin end of the wedge. Um, the, the, the change of the description of, of extremism is designed to eventually a, a type of kind of uh, pre criminalize, I think, many mm -hmm. um, organizations or groups and legitimate uh, movements. Mm -hmm. And we've seen in Europe a reaction to. What would be very just legitimate slogans and, and uh, mm. uh, uh, kind of protest, uh, protest chants and things like this. For example, in Germany, saying "From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free" is actually now deemed to be um, uh, uh, racist or anti-Semitic and so on, and has actually been banned. Uh, there was a recent case where uh, a middle-aged lady posted on her social media um, that that slogan, and mm. the police came and raided her house, arrested where, her. Where was this? Where was this? In Germany. Gosh, I mean, Europe generally, continental Europe, I think, is a lot a more harsher environment for pro-Palestinian voices and for Muslims generally compared to the UK. Although we're moving, I think, in that direction. However, we're not there yet, but uh, it, is, it is very ugly. I mean, the, the, the irony is that the Kut party, this is Netanyahu's own party in Israel, actually has that expression for Israel itself, but that's never demonized or denounced as hate speech. Of course, uh, it's okay if they do it, but not okay. If Palestinians want to uh, have their self determination and their their land, the homeland back, but um, it's very very, very disturbing. So I, I want to ask you, Abdullah, what is extremism? I mean, is it is it this nebulous subjective term, or does it actually have an objective definition, uh, or is it just such? Is the coinage so corrupted that it's just a, a political tool to, you know, demonize one's opponents? I mean, well, what's going on here? What what is extremism? Do you think? Well. Uh due to my you know readings of um uh you could say european and uh, pre-european you could say uh philosophy uh according to ancient mm -hmm. greek and so on and so forth, i have to resist the urge to uh philosophize on, oh, no don't resist um, <laughs> this is probably theology give in to your urges sir to talk to me about theology and philosophy yeah um so the uh, aristotle's uh golden mean uh, um all right okay the the way so basically uh, this has been, in a sense, just very influential, the golden mean concept. The golden mean concept was uh, the, the way to uh, uh, judge whether actions are moral or not um, are where they are. Uh, well, ones might be extreme or not, uh, and ones might be, uh, quote unquote, moderate. So, uh, mm -hmm. for, for example, um, uh, bravery, it would be considered to be the golden mean, you know, sitting in balance, sitting in the middle. Um, of the the uh, of a between what of cowardice on the one hand and yes. kind of wanton throwing your life away on the foolhardiness, other. yes. So between so the extremes yeah. would be yeah cowardice yeah. and foolhardiness, yeah. and uh, so this is where now the, the thing is uh, uh, the Greeks would never use the word uh, uh, extreme so much uh, that you know going to the far extremities, but more, rather just that it's 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 a uh, it's too far one way and too far the other. Uh, the, the, the the idea that there's something called um, uh, some position at the extremities, I believe, uh, is is a more of a recent development in European thinking. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea that you'd have a golden mean for every action and every position, um, it, it comes from Aristotle. And in a sense, uh, the Quran engages with this um, yeah. uh, kind of by the time of of um, you know after Alexander the Great and so on and so forth and the Hellenic philosophy, everyone was acquainted with the idea of the um, golden mean. But uh, the Quran kind of because obviously the creator universe uh, knows uh, the kind of uh, expressions and sayings that were going on in the 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 area where the revelation is coming down to to address human beings, and so mm -hmm. it kind of appropriates in a sense this, uh, but transforms it to an Islamic understanding, which is. 
that uh, you have the, the 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 middle path, you could say, the the the, the straight path, and the veering off that uh, is is transgressing against the boundaries that Allah Subhanahu Allah has set for mankind. So it's not that you're going too far to the right or too far to the left. It's simply that any transgression off this path is already yeah. too far. Yeah, I mean, I read it constantly in the Quran. You get the sense of you know, don't go, uh, don't be the aggressor. Uh, you, you know, uh, in, in exhorting people to balance mizan uh, and uh, what we call what we call moderation. I suppose today is a very anti-extreme document, isn't it? So you know, don't go out there and just fight. Be careful. Uh, you know, use your reason. Have you not considered? It's always appealing to this kind of balanced, uh, intelligent approach to life. I, I, that's my reading, anyway. <laughs> No, of course. Uh, it's mm. so it, it's it's for example, th there is a concept in Islam called ghulu, um, which sometimes is translated as extremism, but uh, it's oh. really t exaggeration. Uh, so ghulu is when you do something that's initially good. Uh, so, for example, uh, you might pray um, and do extra prayers, you know, to hajj or the night prayers and so on and so forth. But ghulu, in one case, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Wasalam, there was one man who would pray constantly in a mosque and he wouldn't even go home to his, his family and yeah. this is now Rolo. he went over the top he exaggerated uh yeah. In, yeah. in in that practice and of course the quran talks uh, addresses the christians and uh, you know to, uh, right. to, to yeah. not do Rolo. Uh, yeah. so you can love jesus we all love jesus uh, you know mm -hmm. salam, Isa mm -hmm. you can do so but they loved him so much that they elevated his position mm -hmm. to be from uh, beyond uh, being a human to being God himself yeah and this yeah. is they did hulu on this so loving Jesus is good but if you love him so much uh, mm. to the point that it causes you to transgress yeah. um and uh, attribute to him what is not to be attributed to to human beings uh, then this yeah, is yeah I think that's pretty good and one of the very controversial terms that keeps on cropping up I know some media reports is, is this terrible word that everyone's very afraid of in Britain anyway this word jihad um and uh and of course there's usually absolutely no understanding of the meaning of the term at all in its islamic context and and but this is this word i mentioned this has been mentioned in the telegraph and the times as an example and this is mentioned in demonstrations which is very rare as an example of extremism actually the very example of it but of course no context is ever given there's no understanding ever given there's no sense that if a people if a whole population are occupied militarily by uh, an occupier, then as the UN says, as the Quran says, everyone seems to agree really, that these people have a right to resist occupation, uh, you know, the imposition of, of an alien uh, military presence on them. Now the word jihad there then becomes simply, simply means resistance, armed resistance is entirely appropriate, uh, many would argue, but that context is never ever given. And so, uh, Muslims are robbed of any mature public discourse on this matter, and it's simply suppressed in a way that would be unthinkable when it came to, say, the Ukrainians uh, being occupied or part of the country being occupied by the Russians, when what the Ukrainians are doing is jihad uh, in the technical Islamic sense, in that they are resisting and occupying. So it, it's very skewed, and I, I, I do quite, I get a bit, a bit angry that the British press doesn't responsibly, intelligently engage with this subject uh, and it simply deals in slogans and loaded and misleading uh, terminologies uh, in, in a way that is very irresponsible, actually. And I say it robs Muslims of a mature discourse where we can talk about this uh, uh, w w with our fellow British citizens. Anyway, that's my rant. Anyway, well, I mean, uh, sometimes uh, the, the the Western governments might say that uh, jihad is good if it's, for example, against the Russians uh, conquering mm. um, Afghanistan, or occupying Afghanistan. Yeah, they were all true. about talking about jihad. Yeah, we support yeah, jihad. The Mujahideen. Yeah. There was a whole Hollywood movie, Rambo Three, I believe, which uh, praised you the... Rambo films. I'm shocked. After that. <laughs> well, cultural studies, all part of my cultural well, studies. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> um, so. So this was, uh, you know, so so in that case, you know, jihad would be appropriate by the West and say that, oh yes, we, this is uh, yeah. this is this is good. Um, I, I, in in Western, obviously, you know, uh, philosophical traditions, the idea of just war, um, mm -hmm. the idea of uh, 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 humanitarian intervention, quote unquote. Um, uh, this is where uh, liberal theory uh, can can 
discuss when it's appropriate for warfare. And they might call the war just a just war, or they might call it, um, you know, an intervention. Um, this is their jihad, and and it has been used at times to justify, whole, you know, full on colonialism to uh, to um, help these uh, the lesser races <laughs> uh, to uh, mature and uh, become enlightened, like they like uh, they are. Uh, so it has been used in, in those in those kind of contexts, mm. uh, but uh, the, w the issue they have more specifically with jihad is it, they're not pacifists, but rather it, it's because Muslims have a separate lens and, and rubric by which they judge what is a just war or what is not a just war. So we not might not we not don't view colonialism to be just, uh, where you just want to you know go to other people's countries and um, suck up their resources and impose a law system upon them that they don't believe in, which is not the Islamic way, of course. Um, the, the, the Sharia has always been only for Muslims and, you know, any other people that, that Muslims have discovered, have encountered during the many centuries, uh, uh, you know, fighting against the Romans, fighting against the Persians and others, uh, Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians, they had their own law system that was not interfered with at all um, whatsoever. Yeah. That's a really important point, because I often think, the, obviously, there were Muslim conquests in the past, in the, in the early centuries, but people... Uh, often in the West assume that because Muslim armies went into, say, North Africa or the Levant, you know, around what we call Syria or whatever, therefore the population, the Christians there, were forced to convert. Or it was like French colonialism when the French, well, you know, occupied Algeria, for example, or Tunisia, whatever. So it was like that. But of course, the where the no people in North Africa were forced to become French and inverted commas, heavy inverted commas, civilized. Um, but that was never the case with the Islamic conquests because the, the, if there was uh, a, the people had autonomy. They had the, as long as they paid their taxes, their jizya, they were protected. They were free to worship and, and eat pork and gamble or whatever Christians do. Um, even though it's forbidden under Sharia, it's permitted under Sharia for them. But that kind of laissez-faire or that kind of pluralism, I should say, um, was never really shown, say, under French colonialism, where, where people had to abandoned their language arabic that abandoned their faith that abandoned their their hijab uh, women did and so on it was much more assimilation into the french way um so it was quite different but people conflate them often and think well we know what colonialism is that's what the muslims must have done but that wasn't really historically what happened was it yeah i mean it, as i said it, it was the Islamic perspective would be that you know it's it's not that uh, we'd uh, permit Christians or Jews or Zoroastrians or what have you to to uh, do things which go against the, the Quran or Sunnah, rather that it was prohibited upon Muslims to impose Sharia or to expect them to abide by the Sharia. So mm. it was Muslims were prohibited from interfering uh, with these other communities. I've used a I coined not a term to describe Islamic governance, which is. Um, a federation of faith communities, a federation of of religions, or, or what have you, uh, because a federation, uh, as the name implies, is uh, you have multiple states uh, where each state is sovereign unto itself, I suppose, and mm. um, uh, they the, each states wouldn't really interfere with, with 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 each other, but there'd be a constitution that would govern, in essence, their interaction, uh, and in an Islamic uh, caliphate system. Uh, each uh, religious community uh, was a state unto itself in, in a sense there, there was no territorial lines uh, there was no uh, you know boundaries or, or anything like this uh, but it was each people was considered to be a community unto their own and yeah. and and so in a, in a in a sense they had their own um uh, uh, sovereignty in a way and all disputes would be negotiated would be resolved according to a a type of agreement that was negotiated when that community was incorporated into the Islamic um, oh. uh, caliphate system. So I mm. use the term a federation of of um, of uh, religious communities or federation of uh, adiyan, uh, plural t for me in Arabic for deen, um, mm. uh, in, in a sense. Which which is again, it's, it's so far from uh, colonialism. Colonialism is about going to other other uh, places, um, extracting resources, and in, and or at the very least, uh, imposing your uh, law system, your values upon the people, in, in a sense, to force convert them. Even if you might not want to change their belief about uh, what is uh, in 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 the hidden things and behind behind the universe and the metaphysics, what have you, uh, you want to imp you're imposing a political and uh, a political structure upon them, a political system, uh, mm. a set of laws and which and values that accompany those laws. You you certainly are imposing that upon them. So Islam didn't do didn't do that at all whatsoever. Mm. No, indeed. I, I wish that was more widely known in, in the West. Muslims tend to know about this, of course. 
So coming back to, if, if I may, to um, current events in, in the UK. So th this new uh, policy that the government's had announced is not a change in the criminal law, is it? There's not like no. things have become illegal. So it's, it's this kind of declaration that the government, government departments, ministers, police, official bodies, public bodies can't work with or give a platform to so-called extremists. And they, I think in Parliament, Grove mentioned a couple of Muslim organisations, didn't he? Do you, do you know what they were? Is it the Muslim Council of Britain, I think, was one? Um, and not the Muslim Council of Britain, uh, uh, the uh, Muslim Association of Britain. Um, oh, Muslim, it sounds okay. similar. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, MEND, um, the uh, Muslim Engagement um, uh, Group for Muslim Engagement in, in like in, in, in elections and, and political right. and campaigning. Um, so these are, I mean, these are these are groups which ostensibly, if any, if you ask them what are their stated positions or beliefs, um, uh, except beyond simply Muslim interests and the Muslim, like protecting Muslim rights and so on, um, you know, you, you couldn't really state much because these these groups don't go around. Uh, uh, saying that they're going to uh, um, uh, you know, change UK into a Sharia state or uh, all this kind of stuff, they they're all simply discussing about uh, Muslim engagement into uh, elections, uh, local affairs, and protecting Muslim rights in in the UK. Uh, but this is deemed to be too much. It's deemed to be you right. know, a bridge too far um, mm -hmm. by like Michael Gove, and that these are declared to be extremists. Of course, Cage as well for or short for Cage prisoners um, who uh, campaigned for. Uh, those who've been uh, locked up in uh, Guantanamo Bay uh, and uh, have not been charged officially of anything, but they're still they're still imprisoned. Uh, those who've been um, uh, harassed by security the security forces in the UK and 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 so on and so forth. Uh, those who've been um, uh, entrapped into uh, with charges and things. Uh, they are all the mentally vulnerable as well. There were cases where there were mentally vulnerable Muslims. Um, have been harassed and uh, conjoled by security forces, which this is what they deal with. Uh, this is the, this is what they deal with, and they they engage via by the legal system. They they, they do uh, political campaigning, but even for them, they're deemed to be extremists by Michael Gove. So the question is, obviously, what is Michael Gove really aiming at uh, when he mentions these groups and organisations? Of course, it's these groups and organisations which are uh, deemed to be uh, groups that are prominent in the Muslim community. Uh, defend Muslim rights against the encroachment of imp imposed uh, hyper-secularization of the Muslims, hyper-liberalization against the Muslim, or muscular liberalism, as the conservatives call it. And that they, they are, these are obstacles that need to be taken out. Uh, so it, these organizations that call for Muslim rights, they get targeted first. And, I, and they're not going to be the last organization that will be targeted. No, I, I mean, the well. five pillars, the uh, independent Muslim news agency in the UK, uh, was apparently on the list of organisations that was going to be announced or denounced even in Parliament, uh, but their, their name didn't appear in the end. And uh, there's speculation that, you know, Five Pillars is, uh, you know, a creditable news agency. Their journalists are part of National Union of Journalists. They, they're they regulated um, to, you know, label journalists as extremists like this would be, you know, pretty unprecedented. It would be crossing various kind of red lines so the uh the speculation is that they their name was removed because of the implications of of calling them out like that but nevertheless they were on the list well it was published i, I remember reading it in i think it was a guardian that i mentioned it uh but they, the government backed off at the last minute so the, the government have five pillars uh which is as i say an probably britain's biggest and most prominent muslim news agency that they, they have them on their sites even though they didn't mention them by name which that that is worrying as well because you know who, who represents muslims in the uk you know uh ca can we have muslim institutions representing us to power and if we can't then that that, that damages civil society let alone our human rights well well of course um so i think i want to give some context to the to uh, viewers um because uh, uh, we 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 both uh, living in the UK are well aware of all these uh, the history of these policies. So let's let's rewind the clock back and just to give a, a, a broad view to people who might be watching overseas and like, what's going on in the UK. So uh, this is, doesn't concern any laws. There's no laws that outlaw quote unquote extremism. Uh, instead, uh, there is a government policy. It's about how the government uh, or the executive branch, you might say. Um, who it deals with, which organizations it will fund um, or it collaborate with, or what have you. Now, there are organizations it will cut off already, which it doesn't even deem to be extremist, like mm. the Muslim Council of Britain, 
uh, the, one of the largest Muslim organizations in the UK um, that it, it has collections of, of masajid, uh, mosques and, and uh, Islamic uh, centers and so on and so forth. Um, it really said it will not deal with them at all whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, it will it completely cut off from them. Um, so, but so the instead of uh, so these these people haven't even been called extremists, but it, it, the, the policy of, of this is to uh, prevent what they call entryism, so to stop um, Muslims that have undesirable opinions from uh, being in the civil service in some capacity to some to some capacity, uh, although they have they haven't technically prohibited employment. Uh, to anyone uh, just yet, but there's this is the implication. So uh, many many years ago, start going back to Tony Blair's era uh, in the, the Labour era. Uh, mm. So the Iraq War is happening, and there is uh, uh, you know uh, some Muslims are angry and upset about the, the massacres of, of Iraqi Muslims and uh, the pre the false pretext for war. Uh, so unfortunately, some in some engage in criminal behaviour um, in the UK. Uh, uh, they uh, commit a terror attacks uh, against the population, believing them to be guilty for the, what their elected government is doing, even though we know that the people don't really decide what the elected government really does. Um, and despite the fact there was there was like record n numbers of, of stop the war yeah, um, yeah. Um, protests and demonstrations, record numbers. It didn't stop the the uh, no. the, the the government. So uh, so the the Labour Party tried to bring up this uh, this this new kind of uh, policy called uh, prevent. Uh, which was about, okay, how do we prevent terror attacks from happening um, rather than just getting the security forces to find a, a plot or a cell or what have you, and then arrest them and what have you. Um, how do we stop the motivating factors uh, that lead to uh, terror attacks? But, and they were using very bogus arguments like, well, it, this, this must be to do with ideology because you don't see, let's say, uh, you know, let's say uh, Japanese um, uh, UK citizens uh, committing terror attacks in the name of Iraq, even though we all, even if you might disagree with the Iraq war, you don't see non-Muslims engaging in those, those terror attacks. Now, the answer is quite, quite simple, which, which is, well, yeah, there's no justification for terror attacks, but if we're approaching this as criminologists would, you're just looking at what, what motivates criminality. In this case, uh, there is a, a solidarity that Muslims all share with each other, a empathy that we share with each other as, as, as a familial bond. Mm -hmm. And this creates then um, anger and resentment at uh, those who uh, are deemed to be attacking and killing our, our members of our family, basically. Mm -hmm. And as Muslims, we're meant to uh, respond to that with, uh, with uh, well, in the UK, with patience, uh, but speaking out, using our tongues, as I say, calling out this injustice and uh, rallying support from Muslims and non-Muslims um, to campaign against us, to put um, political and social pressure, you could say. On, yeah. the on the government, which is what uh, you know, uh, which is which is meant to be fair play in any kind of um, political system. It's it's a it's a peaceful approach, mm -hmm. uh, but there will be a segment of Muslims, uh, like there are segments of in many other movements in in the civil rights movement in America. Uh, you had you know peaceful strands which were talking about uh, uh, campaigning uh, to re uh, remove the Jim Crow laws, the ra racist kind of. Mm. Um, yeah, Martin, Luther, Martin Luther King on one side, much more pacifist, shall we say, inspired by Gandhi, but arguably, all the way to, say, the Black Panthers, uh, maybe in New York, who, who were revolutionaries and who believed in militant physical action. I mean, there's a kind of spectrum of responses to injustice in America. Is that what you're trying to say? There is this... Yes. Yeah. 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 So mm. uh, it, it, in every situation, in every cause that you're going to have a mainstream, uh, usually peaceful uh, movement. And then there's going to be a little segment of people who uh, can't control or restrain themselves and sometimes unfortunately and they will engage in violence in almost every single uh, circumstance where there especially when uh, there is oppression and violence in, involved by those who have power uh yeah. there would there you, you tend to see this um so uh, so the, the british government of course uh, they didn't want to the, the root cause of this is the is the war itself is, is going to war in iraq and and, and uh, bombing the iraqis and killing them but they don't want to change that that's they can't change that they don't want to change no, that. no, that's, uh, tony blair said that was irrelevant of course that's not not, not yes. a factor at all i mean but i mean i just want to put a footnote here because i just found it fascinating going back two thousand years it sounds like a serious change of subject but i don't think it is uh josephus the first century jewish historian wrote a book called uh the jewish war and um you know, he talks about the four, I think it's four, yeah, the four main uh, Jewish groups uh, around Palestine at that time. So you had like the Sadducees. These were, I don't know, to, to, 
to put them in modern jargon, and this is not very historical, but you know, they, they are the uh, the sellouts. Okay, those that uh, you know, the colonized. Yeah, they, they Hellenic, maybe Hellenic era. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll work with the Romans. They're not so bad. It is the occupiers, of course. The Romans occupied. So the Sadducees, the Pharisees were kind of. Uh, uh, like the, the popular mass movement, they, they didn't like the occupiers, but they were great stress on piety and patience and maybe maybe protest, whatever. But you had another group, the, the zealots, um, and, and these guys uh, went around basically doing terrorist acts and they'd attack um, not only the Romans, uh, you know, out of the blue and kill them, but also uh, what they saw as collaborating Jews as well. Uh, but this is a Jewish um, revolutionary but militant group. So you, you, you had, I remember when I first read Josephus, I thought I can map exactly these Jewish groups onto the Muslim world because the, it's the dynamics are so similar. You have an, a massive occupying power, like whether it be America or a satellite. Kind of, and then what, how do the Muslims respond to this? And you get this, these different responses. But you're right, it is a small minority that engaged in the zealots who engaged in terrorist acts. And of course, they were ruthlessly hunted down by the Romans as the equivalents today are hunted down by the Americans. But I thought the, the equivalent, because Judaism is very similar to Islam in many ways in terms of its theology, understanding of law, uh, and, and so on. So I thought the, the, the comparison was very striking. I think perhaps um, there, there, there was someone that beat you to that in the comparison, which was uh, Monty Python. Uh, part of my cultural <laughs> studies, um, the uh, they uh, portrayed this, so the, the the Judean People's Front or the oh, yeah. uh, the People's Front of Judea, yes. and, uh, which is a splinter group, um, uh, which were an insurgency against the Romans, um, yeah, 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 and yeah. and then comparing that to the, I think the the the, the Palestinian um, People's Front and things like this, yeah, uh, which is which is w w today's um, Palestine. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, of course, uh, plus a chance, as, a chance, as the French say. Um, yeah, they do. And so, so the the Labour government, not the not the Tories. Everyone people people forget this. The Labour government implemented the prevent policy, yeah. and it was argued uh, that ideology, um, not legitimate grievances, are mm -hmm. the motivational factors behind yeah. some a, people. A, a million to, dead Iraqi Muslims. Innocent dead men, women, children can't be a reason why anyone. No, no, God, yeah, that's, that's what nothing to do with it. Mean, it's just this ir what, 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 irrational what hatred that yeah, Muslims have. Yeah. That's uh, yeah, unbelievable. And we were expected yeah. to buy this. And Tony Blair actually said that. I remember him, well, I vaguely remember him saying it. And uh, it's the most outrageous thing imaginable, really. But a lot of people believed him because hey, he was the prime minister. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is um, so like uh, I, I once was on a, a TV program called uh, The Big Questions. Um, with uh, an individual you might, you, you might be aware of, uh, called Douglas Murray, um, and uh, he was making, he was again reiterating, he's been reiterating a point about ideology, ideology, ideology is a reason behind uh, the attackers of uh, Lee Rigby, for example. Um, so um, I pointed out uh, that uh, there's a there's a country in South America, uh, Guyana, and in Guyana there is the the population of Muslims. I believe is around uh, seventeen percent or sixteen percent. It was like a oh. quite, quite proportionally speaking, it's quite a lot. Yeah. Guyana is a liberal country. It's a secular liberal country, just like UK. Um, but why don't we then, if the if the uh, hypothesis holds true, mm -hmm. that uh, it, uh, Muslims commit acts of violence due to justice? Uh, ideologically motivated hatred of non-Muslims, I think, I believe, which is what they're trying to imply here. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we see terror attacks occurring in Ghana when there's a, there's a larger, proportionally speaking, population of Muslims there, proportion to the population than there is in France, in, in England and so on. Why don't we see terror attacks in in, in uh, Switzerland uh, targeting the, the Swiss um, specifically? Why, why not in the in, you know, Republic of Ireland uh, attacks by uh, Muslims targeting the Irish? Um, the, the answer is that these countries are not involved in in wars. Um, well, this and is a point said. He, he said, uh, if the interview was tr true, but you know, what, why, is no, why is no one attacking Sweden? I think he said, it was like, well, yeah. Sweden, well, Sweden got to do anything, but you yeah. know, uh, so, uh, which, which is the point. Uh, so, yeah, of course, there's a connection. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, that that book uh, was it uh, Bruce Lawrence, um, which yes. is uh, uh, yeah. message uh, yeah, messages. Yeah, I, 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 I can grab it if you want. But yeah, <laughs> that's what Bin Laden says in one of those books. Yeah, yeah he so yeah he collected all the sayings of Bin Laden, and it was um, it was fascinating because we don't because most people don't are not exposed to um, his justifications. Now, uh, as much as I disagree with um, his justifications for 
um, targeting non-combatants. And his, and his justification wasn't from um, the Quran or Sunnah. He didn't say uh, the Quran or Sunnah motivates me to uh, or allows me to target to non-combatants. Um, uh, quite the opposite, he, he admits, he says that when he's asked by an interviewer, I said, like, isn't it prohibited to target non-combatants? Because uh, you're right, it's forbidden by the Prophet Muhammad uh, uh, to uh, target um, women and children. Uh, but he said, um, but this law isn't absolute. It's not, you know. No, uh, no, what do you say, boys? Yeah, I may correct you. He said this law is not set in stone. Uh, that, that's in the English translation I've got here. I remember this. I actually got. I can get it. and highlight it. So in other words, that Bin Laden was a liberal or reformist in some <laughs> way. He, he thought you could uh, actually ignore fundamental tenets of the Sharia, the Muhammad's, Muhammad's teaching, uh, because he didn't. He didn't because they're not set in stone. We don't have to follow that now. Even though there's an absolute prohibition on targeting women, children, and babies and whatnot. By the way, that targeting is explicitly enjoined in the Bible, by the way, in, in many Old Testament passages, but uh, that's another subject. Against Amalek, which Benjamin Netanyahu. Exactly. Against and of course, he's, yeah. not, he's not an extremist, even though he's actually invoking the Am Amaleks, who were uh, 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 people who were targeted by the, according to the Bible, anyway, the Israelis. And were commanded to be wiped out, specifically targeting women, children, and babies. I mean, one Samuel fifteen in the Bible is the biblical reference. You can read it for yourself. So Nehemiah had this dog whistle reference, which most people in the West didn't get, of course, because they don't know their Bibles. Um, but those of us who do recognised it. Um, but he's not an extremist, even though he's calling for genocide. It's remarkable, isn't it? He, he's literally qu quoting genocidal biblical verses yeah. on yeah. the on the eve of launching a military operation uh, against. Yeah. Uh, a mostly civilian population yeah and yeah and somehow that's our our, our allies that we must uh, uh are, are part of the enlightened west and so on and so forth um mm. so so yeah so going back to the point was um so uh bin Laden argued that simply that well america and britain they don't seem to uh care if they're civilians that, uh in an area when they bomb they use the atomic weapons against the japanese uh so he argued that if they can target our civilians, we can target their civilians in order to deter them from continuing to target our civilians. It was this a kind of strange utilitarian uh, argument, but that non-scriptural wasn't a scriptural argument. It wasn't based on the Quran and Sunnah. It was mm. a um, uh, a modern uh, Western argument. And some might even argue you can find this in liberal um, uh, war theory yeah, um, yeah. called the Supreme Emergency Exemption um, that... Um, uh john rules uh, who is a, 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 the most preeminent uh, liberal theorist of the previous century um uh, actually advocated argued for that uh, and, and many others and in fact it's actually the mainstream opinion in uh, liberal uh, uh, warfare theory which states that you can target civilians if you're in an emergency situation that your your people are going to be oppressed and uh, their freedom removed forever uh, you can then uh, go to that extreme if it will help you win the war um, and I also add a, an extra point. This is not really relevant per se, but um, mm. uh, some people have, there's been many um, uh, kind of rabbis and others online uh, who've been discussing Jewish um, uh, legal theory concerning warfare. And I, th there's a difference of opinion, I, I, no doubt, um, you know, uh, perhaps. I mean, I don't know all the, the full range of opinion because I, I don't specialize in this. But there are many video clips you can find, um, uh, which I've, I've looked for, and I've, I've not just taken clips of, done by media agencies. I've actually looked for uh, lectures given by um, various rabbis on this the topic and Amalek gets discussed and mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, so m many of them, uh, obviously I, I can't say this is all Jewish opinion because it is, it, Jewish opinion is vast and diverse and, and so on. But there is clearly a segment in, uh, in Jewish legal theory uh, that argues that you can target civilians if, it's if it will bring a permanent peace um, by either it, you know the thoroughly defeating the enemy, making sure that they don't um, dare to aggress against uh, the state of Israel in the future. So there's I've seen some discussions which I can uh, perhaps. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've, I've, I've seen one, one rabbi say the, one of the reasons we have to kill the children is because otherwise they'll grow up and attack Israel. Because if we, if we kill their parents, then you know that you, you're going to have this um, you know this threat emerging in the future. It's exactly the same argument that a certain group of people in Germany used in the 1930s um yeah, yeah. now the, re the reason I mentioned this is um is because you the British government will n never ever consider or argue that those opinions expressed uh by s some religious authorities now there might be those that disagree with them but those th but those that do will never be called extremist 
Mm. Um, but when it, if if there are uh, Muslims who um, are, are not arguing that at all whatsoever, because Islam prohibits this, mm. uh, but simply says that, for example, um, a, you know, jihad is uh, is uh, legitimate in defensive contexts. Just simply saying that, just yeah. not even relating to any particular conflict. Just simply saying jihad mm. is legitimate as uh, in uh, defensive context to fight mm -hmm. against an aggressor. They will be called extremist for yeah. that opinion. And yeah. um, Michael Gove uh, mentions this uh, in his book, uh, uh, Celsius, Celsius 7 7, uh, a, a reference to, I think, uh, Fahrenheit 451, I think it was, um, uh, if I remember the, 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 that book correctly, sorry, which was a, a, a book about a dystopian future of, of censorship um, and also combining it with the 7 7 bombing. So he was mixing into this, this, this book because um, he's arguing that his opinion is very unpopular to say, but basically the problem is. Uh, these are opinions within the Muslim community that are extremist. And he mentioned jihad as something which is an extremist belief to hold. So you're just simply believing that jihad has a um, a warfare aspect to it uh, is extremist, full stop, even though it's mainstream Islamic belief and, and, and understanding for centuries. And there's no difference of opinion among amongst this. Uh, so th this is the kind of uh, situation that, that we're, we're, we're getting, was, which is the Brit British government from the time of the, the Labour Party, but it became more explicit when the, in the Tories took over and under David Cameron, uh, that it was specific aspects of Islamic opinion, uh, Islamic beliefs and creed uh, mm -hmm. that was deemed to be not acceptable for a Muslim to hold. Uh, mm -hmm. David Cameron also mentioned that it was a problem that there are Muslims that have a solidarity to all the Muslims around the world. Mm. Uh, and not most, and not a a primary loyalty uh, to their their state and uh, their their countrymen. When I hear that, it's, it's, just, it's so ironic. I'm thinking of uh, 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 American Jews uh, in the states, obviously, who are, have may have dual citizenship. Even if they don't, often their loyalty is to this country in the Middle East rather than to the United States. Actually, or, or as a dual loyalty, or as a compromise loyalty, or whatever. But that but that criticism never applies to them ever, 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 ever. You know, nothing wrong with that, but putting the interests of that Middle East country first. But if Muslims have this global solidarity, which they do, and it's there in Christian theology too, the idea of the body of Christ, where people are united by their by their incorporation into Christ, as they call it, um, that, that there's also that global sense. But it's become so secularized now. It didn't used to be, but it is now um, that it's become virtually meaningless. But for Muslims, it's still a vibrant part of our faith that we are brothers and sisters of each other wherever we may be in the world but it's a very characteristically abrahamic belief it's not just a muslim belief if you like in that sense it's very abrahamic uh so you'll find it in all the three abrahamic if you can call them that, abrahamic religions traditionally so yeah <laughs> so um so th these these uh, counter extremism, quote unquote, uh, mm. uh, policies were from the outset designed to target um, uh, Muslims specifically, yeah. uh, because, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, in in other religions and other faiths, what have you, you might have uh, concepts which are, uh, which if a Muslim said it, uh, it would be obviously it would be deemed to be uh, you know extremist, uh, clear cut. Um, like, 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 for example, some opinions amongst um, in, uh, in the Jewish laws of warfare, and in, according to the Halakha system, um, but uh, but of course that's ignored. Also, another point I actually mentioned once was there was a, a huge foray in the UK about um, uh, Muslim marriages and uh, Sharia tribunals, which are yeah. voluntary voluntary arrangements, yeah. um, and the argument was that there's, there's a lack of equality because in Islam uh, a man can be can get divorced quite easily. Uh, whereas uh, a woman at least needs to go to a Muslim uh, judge yeah. uh, or, or, or some kind of arbitrator, and but she can still unilaterally get a divorce. That's not stop prohibited uh, for her to do so. She has mm. to go to a judge. Now I I, may, I I pointed out at that time that um, well in England everyone has to go to a judge <laughs> to get a divorce, uh, uh, and sometimes it, you know and there was even a case in England where a woman was actually denied a divorce in the UK, mm. uh, but. Uh, in in uh, in Jewish Beit Din or kind of Jewish uh, uh, tribunals, which is, which is the equivalent uh, of the Sharia court, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to yeah, well, well, tribunals because it's technically not a, it's not a court because it has no no power behind it. Right. Okay. Um, but in, in, in Jewish tribunals, uh, according to Halakha law, uh, women actually cannot get unilaterally divorced. It's prohibited. Right. They they have to get permission uh, from their their husband. It, it's called a get. 
uh, not the English word, but this, this is a uh, the word that used a, a get. They had to get this. Uh, they have to get a get, <laughs> uh, which I guess. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so. And my, my, my point being is, okay, you know, th this is, this is, you know, the uh, uh, Jewish law. Okay. That's their community that, that, you know, they should be allowed to follow that, the, their own law system. Uh, Islam gave them the same, the same um, uh, kind of uh, ability to do so. But uh, if the Muslims believe that, right, if there were Muslims saying that a woman couldn't get divorced unless she gets permission of her husband, uh, they would be, uh, they would be uh, uh, even more uh, uh, government clampdowns on on Muslim uh, yeah. tribunals or investigations of tribunals or reports and and so on and so forth. So there'll be calls from the rafters uh, to to uh, limit uh, the application of, of Sharia law. Uh, but yet, there's absolute dead silence on mm. this uh, from our uh, Semitic cousins, um, uh, the uh, you know uh, the, the you know kind of those who are following the, the Jewish law and, and the Halakha law, so the I raise this point to, to highlight that counter extremism is basically targeted specifically against Islamic beliefs and uh, Muslims. Um, the far right more uh, loosely, but that uh, more as an afterthought to to look like it's being even handled. Yeah, I, I was never terribly impressed because yeah, the, I think it was Patriotic Alternative was mentioned uh, by Grove yesterday in Parliament and one other organisation I never heard of. But I always I always get the impression these are kind of half-hearted uh, additions to a list which is really seriously meant for Muslims, really, <laughs> just to give the appearance of balance, so to speak. But the and, and indeed, I think the government has said, I mean, have said that their main concern is the Muslims anyway. So we're not really fooled by this apparent uh, e even handedness, I think. Um, so yeah. I just, just, just want to, sorry, carry on. No, no I mean, like, so um, now coming coming up to the uh, recent days. So, so yeah. David Cameron and Theresa May, um, at one point, Theresa May wanted to implement uh, something called um, uh, TPIMS, uh, which is a type of antisocial so you have you know, asbos in the uk so antisocial behavior disorders so uh it, you're if you're engaged in antisocial social behavior you commit violence or whatever your nuisance you can be banned from certain areas of, of city or town or what have you um and in some cases there are there are uh, so t pims uh there are those who are under an order which if they are they're not really convicted of uh, i suppose well, well maybe they've been let out or whatever but if they are basically suspected that they might engage in terrorism they can be confined to their house um or yeah. tagged or what have you yeah. um there was now Theresa may at one point wanted to implement extremism um uh orders which would limit people who haven't committed any crime they just express opinions which are legal uh, but deemed to be extremist, that they would be prohibited from accessing the internet, from going on, giving lectures, uh, giving um, khutbahs in mosques. Uh, that got shot down pretty pretty quickly. But these the, these were the type of things that the Conservative Party tried to ramp up in terms of their counter extremism um, mm. uh, uh, policy. And now, now David Cameron, during his uh, reign, quote unquote, uh, he uh, his tenure, uh, he. Uh, it, th there was a policy, there was a definition of extremism that the government used, um, which talked about uh, uh, those who are who contradict British values. Um, democracy was mentioned, and uh, it, it was a bit more vaguer, uh, basically, and it was hard to implement. Uh, it was something which, yeah. uh, 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 it, and of course, implement as in you know organization that the government would disengage with or they wouldn't uh, um, liaise with. But it was used at times by the Charity Commission. Um, which uh, which investigates and re reviews uh, charities in the UK, mm. um, and there are certain benefits when you if you have charity status. Uh, uh, anyone who donates money to you obviously it gets it gets tax exempted um, that donation. Uh, so they started to uh, use this policy to investigate charities for extremism, even though it's not there's no statutory uh, mm. requirement for you to uh, have a certain set of beliefs or not express a certain set of beliefs mm. as long as uh you're not breaking the law uh, basically you're funding terrorism uh so it was used in that, in that level to to uh harass charities uh, and, and many mosques are charities basically because it'd be you know charitable trusts um to to harass them and uh, whenever they invite a speaker that the charity commission um doesn't approve of of course it was not helped by the fact that the charity commission the head of charity commission oh, uh, yes. uh shawcross um, was works for the Henry Jackson uh, uh, Society, which uh, uh, is a neoconservative um, uh, think tank that uh, with, with uh, the Douglas Murray now is currently the head of it, 
uh, which has has obviously had expressed issues with Muslims, per, you know, Muslims uh, immigration and Muslim beliefs uh, and uh, the the problem of uh, integrating or in, uh, assimilating Muslims in the UK. Um, I think obviously Douglas Murray himself famously said that um, conditions sh should be made harder for Muslim, mm. across the board for Muslims uh, in the UK so that Muslims don't come to the UK and and what have you. So um, clearly, then there was an anti-Muslim bias animus um, within. Um, many of these uh, public institutions uh, led by this definition of extremism mm -hmm. and uh, but but again it didn't really go anywhere uh, so now recently Michael Gove has unveiled this uh, new definition uh, which he says is more specific um, it can be employed um, uh, more precisely compared to the previous one and this was off the bat of uh, demonstrations that were calling for an end of the massacre of innocent people in Gaza. Mm. This was the so-called extremists that have to be clamped down upon. And the it was also argued, as you heard, and quite concerningly, that you know um, uh, the rhetoric of Islamists taking over British government, Islamists um, uh, undermining democracy. You know, imagine if you took the word Islamist and even not even put the word Jew, just put the word Zionist. If someone mm. said that Zionists control uh, the UK government, you'd be called an anti-Semite, basically. Mm. Um, uh, but if you use the word Islamist, it's fair game. It's preposterous, the idea they've taken over, because you know, the, who runs the government? It's the Conservative Party. They've been in power for years. <laughs> they, they still hold all the leaders of power. So I, I've, I simply can't think in the most wild universe how this could possibly be the case. But serious politicians are actually saying this. Like another one said recently that Islamists have taken control of London, which is absurd. Um, Anyway, he he left that that MP left the Conservative Party is now part of Reform, I think, which is an even more Islamophobic party in in the UK. Um, yeah. I mean, so, so, so just to give you the the the, the previous definition. So, um, in two thousand eleven, uh, the def the previous definition of extremism was active opposition to fundamental British values, including democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and the mutual respect and tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. So that was the, the previous definition. Um, but then this has been replaced now with a, a new definition, uh, which uh, gives, uh, well, I'll, I'll just quote it for the benefit of the viewers there, yeah. but we, maybe we could put a, a link to, to it on, on, yeah. uh, on, on the descriptions. Uh, so this is where Michael Gove's uh, description of it. Um, extremism is the promotion or advancement of an ideology based on violence, hatred, um, or intolerance that aims to one, negate or destroy the fundamental rights and freedoms of others. Um, uh, and then it has a little link to a footnote to uh, links to the Human Rights Act Schedule 1. We'll come back to that in a bit. Um, yeah. uh, or two, undermine, overturn or replace the UK's system of liberal parliamentary democracy and democratic rights um, or intentionally create a permissive environment for others to achieve the results in one or two, uh, which is quite scary because this means that uh, you might not be deemed to be extremist in your beliefs. You could be a uh, card carrying liberal from the liberal Democrats party, what have you. But if you even give a platform potentially to those who Michael Gove on the British government deems to be extreme, then mm -hmm. you yourself could fall into the definition of being yeah. in the extremist category, even if it's not your beliefs, you're just giving a platform or potentially you argue that people, um, uh, should be given, should give platforms to those who are deemed to be extreme, or not deny them platforms. Potentially, that could apply to you. So, simply, you could be a quote unquote li liberal free speech advocate, and you could be called extremist. Yeah. Uh, potentially, like this. Um, and then it then it it goes into the uh, the uh, further discussion as to what these uh, a tough see <laughs> a explanation of of what these things mean. Um, and uh, in, it references, obviously, Schedule One of the Human Rights Act, uh, which talks about you know protected characteristics, so you know freedom of belief, freedom of assembly, uh, freedom of expression, uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, uh, the freedom from being uh, discriminated, so you can't be discriminated uh, by the uh, UK government. Now, this is where, now this is where I s kind of use this argument uh, in my discussion with Nigel Farage. At the end of that discussion, I say I, I have actually there is one organization I'd like to enter into the list of um, extremist organizations, and this is one which Ooh, has. What could that be? No, I'll, I'll let you have, uh, 
Do you for, lead us up to this? Uh, who, who is this mystery organization that falls foul of this new definition? Right. So it's an organization that uh, is 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 uh, hindering uh, people from giving demonstrations of protest, which is a, a part okay. of Schedule One. The that sounds, assembly that sounds and really bad, Abdullah. So that's obviously a pretty dodgy organization. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they yeah, they're trying to demonize. They're trying to clamp down. They they they've urged the police to clamp down on people who are demonstrating, even though oh, they're not breaking the law. Clearly, a very very extreme organization. Yeah. yeah. And. This organization has been advocating that based on people's beliefs, they should be treated differently compared wow. to their fellow citizens. Well, that's very illiberal, contrary to British values, I would say. What, what organization is this, Abdullah? Yeah, well, uh, the British government. The British government. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, uh, and this, the, okay. the Tories more specifically, um, although Labour doesn't seem to be disagreeing much with this. The so. is guilty of its own definition okay yeah and i mean Nigel Farage said oh, maybe that's a bit of a stretch say no i i, I can actually make a very strong argument because because what is an extremism uh, a counter extremism policy if you know I, I mentioned on in my discussion with Nigel Farage i said look at least the americans had the wherewithal with their first amendment mm. to say countering violent extremism yeah, yeah. so they were only going to go after violence um so anyone that motivates uh anyone that's motivated to commit an act of violence that's the uh, uh extremism they're going to go after uh, but in to simply say no no not violent extremism um but we're going to go after extremism it's per se which is just simply beliefs and ideas and then go after them how well we're going to treat them differently they're going to be denied the same civil rights that other people individual citizens organizations are entitled to then you're literally saying that you should uh, discriminate uh, people based on their beliefs, which goes against the human schedule one of the Human Rights Act, mm. which ironically is used as the basis to measure <laughs> whether mm. you're extremist according to the this counter extremism policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the extremism counter extremism policy is itself an extremist uh, right. by by that measure. No, I think there's a there's a powerful case that can be made uh, there. Absolutely. Well, um, I think that's uh, nearly an hour. I think that is a fascinating uh, foray into the, the follies of what's going on in Britain at the moment uh, about so-called extremists and extremism. Uh, and, and of course, more seriously, whilst we're discussing this, the, the war crimes against uh, the innocent Palestinians uh, continue. I noticed yesterday or the day before the EU foreign minister, this is the most senior diplomat of the European Union, uh, publicly stating that Israel is uh, using mass starvation as a weapon of war. And he was very clear on this as, as a Spanish diplomat, but representing the European Union itself. So even Israel's own allies, purported allies, uh, are now calling out, uh, actually speaking truth for once, uh, and that Israel is using starvation as a weapon of war, which of course is a war crime, and is genocide. If you're doing it against a civilian population, which is the case, and is that's what's happening, then this is a war crime and genocide. So basically, the argument is over. I'm not quite sure what the International Court of Justice have yet to decide, really, because it's all pretty obvious. But um, whilst that's going on, uh, this is the real world and, and not um, these somewhat nebulous and vague uh, so-called definitions of extremism, which actually capture... Her Majesty's government itself in that very definition, as Abdullah has uh, rather brilliantly just uh, argued, I think. So thank you very much indeed, Abdullah, for your time. Um, from this, you're always popping into TV studios and debating with prominent politicians in Europe, in Britain, like Farage. So thank you for sparing time to come on. Trolling them, basically. I'm, I'm just... Good. <laughs> <laughs> Trolling them, exactly. You do it so well. All right, that's fantastic. Sorry, do you want to say any, any last words before we conclude? Uh, yes, I mean, in essence, just simply that, um, you know, the, the UK public and anyone in other countries uh, should, uh, you know, be defiant and maintain a stance against counter extremism and policy, which is uh, it's, it's thought policing. Um, and it's because the, the, UK, the government currently is as... Uh, Obviously, dog whistle politics. It wants to appeal to uh, populist anti-immigration sentiment. It wants to appeal yeah. to uh, those who uh, 
uh, who have been told to fear Muslims and uh, fear Islam, um, uh, but also it's part of its, uh, in a sense, a forced assimilation policy because it, it deems that Islam itself is is not compatible with um, being in Britain, and that Muslims have to change their opinions. And if Muslims don't change their opinions, because uh, because it's difficult by law to force people to ch to change their opinions or to uh, silence expressions, certain beliefs or ideas, they will bring in a, 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 a slow form of creeping uh, kind of criminalization, you could say, uh, starting with discrimination and discriminatory treatment uh, and, and civil discrimination, you could say, against them in order to uh, uh, silence uh, authentic uh, expressions of Islam and to s create a secularized form of Islam uh, kind of by, by, by hook or by crook. So mm. this is what um, it, these extremism policies highlight, you could say, lib liberalism's um, intolerance, fundamental intolerance uh, to uh, beliefs that are truly, truly different uh, to itself, that has a, a completely different paradigm beyond the sovereignty yeah. of the individual, but belief in sovereignty of the creator yeah. as the as the ultimate um, source of of good and bad and, and morality absolutely i think that that just that profound observation it gets to the root of this actually uh it really does and that's another subject of course the philosophical paradigms the differences between liberalism and islam good an excellent note to conclude on thank you very much abdullah for your time uh and until next time salam alaikum